Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 228 for Monday, September 30th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by for and about working musicians here, exhausted after a weekend of playing and lots of other stuff uh, in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California. Not for long, Paul Kent. That's right. Yes. Big changes coming up for you, my friend. I am. Yeah. There'll be some good stuff to talk about as I go through that because, you know, just real quick, um, I'm moving. Um, and I'm probably moving about two to three hours away. Oh, so but, you're, you're not just moving, thing, you're relocating. Yeah. But, you know, I have this band that I love that I've been, you know, I've had for 20 years. And so, uh, you know, there's a strategy. I'm certainly not going to let the band go. And I have, you know, I have a, I have a center of gravity here that will, you know, is worth keeping gigs for. So, um, yeah, as I get through this, I certainly want to share some experiences about it, but, uh, moving about two and a half, three hours away, the basic message that I shared with the band when I told them, and I told them last October is, um, you know, we play pretty much every weekend from May through September. It's probably going to mean every other weekend. I'm happy to come up here. My dad's up here. I can stay with him. That's cool. Terry's, Terry's mom is up here. You know, we have, re- and we have all our friends and, and, you know, I have a great base of gigs down here. There's plenty of gigs where I'm going, I think, but uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll find out then that, yeah, find that'll out. actually be a great, I mean, both, both sides of this will be a great, uh, it, it, fodder for yet more more content here, which I think is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, it's exciting and um, it's requiring some planning and good communication. Like like all things in life, you know, the band could have freaked out if I just would have been. Oh, by the way, I'm leaving next weekend. That's so I gave them a lot of time, yeah. and then the deal is to prove to them that I really mean it. And so I am working very hard right now to book those every other weekends. And, uh, you know, show them that we'll still have a a pretty good calendar. And if anything really good, you know, uh, paying works out, you know, it can be more than that. I mean, it'll be just a payday, right? Right. That's right. uh, But it's harder to take a $50 gig, you know, when you have to drive three hours for it. That it is. Yes. That it is. That it is. (laughs) No matter how much exposure they give you, it's hard. (laughs) Well, you can always expose yourself. You know, that's what uh, webcams are for, Paul. Wait, that's not what we're talking about today, is it? (laughs) It's a different podcast. (laughs) Different podcast. So I sealed my fate at the end of last week's show. (laughs) I said, I got three outdoor weekends. The weather looks great. Hopefully I don't come back and say it rained. Well, on Thursday, it rained. Uh, so, (laughs) So we didn't play that gig. Saturday, though, we um, yet another outdoor gig. These were Thursday and Saturday were acoustic gigs uh, on ones that was supposed to be on a deck in Portsmouth at the Gaslight. That was the one that was rained out. The other one was at this place called the Dairy Field in Manchester, which is a uh, it's a golf course. Beautiful deck overlooking the course. Great vibe and everything. And the weather wasn't like the weather was that questionable sort of New England weather. It turned out to be totally fine. In fact, it was a gorgeous night on the deck. It was it was like we got an extra night of summer. Uh, It was really, really nice. But um, all day Saturday, uh, we had our daughter home from school. It was parents weekend. And she's like, I don't want to hang out on campus. So what 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 should we do? And we went to a fair here, which happens throughout New England this time of year. Uh, perfect, you know, late summer day for, I mean, really fall, early fall day, but felt like a late summer day for, uh, for this fair. But it was like, okay, we're going to go walk around the fair for like six or seven hours and then right straight. So I had to load all my gear into my car because the fair was basically on the way to the, this gig. And then I had to drive to this gig where I was going to go play and sing for three and a half hours. So mm. hydration was the key for me to get to that gig and not be like completely dried out and worn out. And I succeeded at that. It was, it was all, you know, everybody was, we were all on the same page. I think I spent, I probably spent a hundred bucks buying like waters and juices and stuff at this fair. Cause that's how they, you know, that's how fairs work. <laughs> but, um, but it all worked out. But um, Saturday night we had a sub, um, my friend CJ who has played with me with Amanda's band was filling in for Jimmy and monkey fist and a guitar in uh, you know, an acoustic trio like that is 
really the foundational instrument. I mean, I play sure. my, my cajon and, you know, but that's not, I always said, I'm not the drummer on those gigs. I'm, I'm the, the, uh, you know, accent guy. Almost a, it's, yeah, it's almost a rhythm instrument, right? It's yeah. Almost a, the, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so but the acoustic guitar does drive the bus on that. It drives the bus. Right. And John, uh, our singer also plays guitar. And in fact, he and I have done gigs as a duo before, but this was sort of a bigger one. We didn't really want to take that path. And so we brought CJ in, but I knew, you know, I'd played some gigs with CJ and I knew he understood like what was going on. And of course we put together a set list ahead of time. We sent him all the songs. He sent us songs that he knows we sort of combined lists and I built a, a fixed set list for the night. We did not follow it, you know, song for song. We sort of detoured around and, and did some stuff, but having both, ha I, you know, I've always said that a having the set list is great because when you don't know what to do next, you know what to do next. But mm. even better than that is going through the process of building the set list kind of puts all this stuff, you know, in my head in like the active Ram zone, right? Where it's like, oh, it's all right there. If somebody says, oh, I don't want to play that song. It's like, well, yeah, but we have this other thing. You know, let's do that because it's all sort of just fresh in my head. And man, CJ just like he killed it. It did not yeah. it did not feel like we had a sub. I mean, we were obviously we were aware that, you know, that, that CJ was not Jimmy, um, you know, but it like there was never a point where it felt like we were pulling teeth, uh, you know, just to get through the set or whatever. In fact, it was like, oh, yeah, I guess we have to take a break. You know, like we should pace this out a little bit. OK, fine. But it, like we were we had more songs than we needed. Everybody was part of the deal. Somebody requested a ACDC tune. They, and so CJ started playing Shook Me All Night Long and we made it through that. Uh, we, mm -hmm. had to do, we had to do some interesting things with harmonies. It was really funny, actually. There was a perfect lesson there. He's like, I can sing it. I'm like, okay, great. So he plays the intro on his guitar, on his acoustic guitar. And as soon as he starts singing, he, you know, it's like he thought he could sing it. He really did, you know, and it was, it was a fast machine, Crazy. you know, yeah. But, yeah, but that's exactly what he did. He's like, uh oh, that receiver's not open. Check down. Who do I have? Who do I have? It was like, he found yeah. the note. And, and then all I did was come in with the harmony above him and he had like the grit and the, the substance to the, the tone to the sound. And John, he, sound, he sang it an octave down. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And I just sang it above. I sang a harmony above him, not up where, where, you know, Brian Johnson is, but, but up above him and, and it worked. It gave it. it everybody was like, that was friggin' amazing. How'd you guys pull that off? Like, <laughs> uh, good question. Excellent. Yeah. But it was just one of those things where it's like everybody trusted each other and it all just worked. And we really had a good time. It, we, we really, um, it worked out really well. I was, it was funny though. I caught myself, you know, I was kind of in my own head for most of the gig solely because, you know, I was thinking a lot about, uh, you know, what's going on, you know, with CJ, make sure he's got what he needs. Does he know that like we played one song and, uh, and he did not know that the capo needed to be on, you know, the, the second fret. So we want, it was the, the way by fastball and the way John has, uh, has that charted. It was, um, you know, he, he, ha he has it charted on the capo and CJ didn't know that. So we wound up playing it a whole step down, which was, you know, whatever. But, you know, so like those kinds of things were going through my head and I wasn't really thinking about the crowd. And at one point, really just for myself, like CJ started a tune and I just started clapping on the two and four and suddenly realized, oh, holy crap, like the whole place is clapping on the two and four. <laughs> I'm performing right now, you know, like, right. Got it. And uh, and it's just one of those things. It like it, it was a nice reminder, like, right. Yeah. People, this isn't a wallpaper gig. People are actually watching like, OK, right. You know, re reassess, reevaluate, you know, recalibrate all of that good stuff. But you mean you forgot to always be performing? Well, evidently, I didn't forget. I just wasn't thinking about it. But I, it turns out <laughs> I was performing anyway, which was good. But yes, I did sort of consciously forget about it. But but there is there was that lesson like, right. You know, even if the people aren't reacting, they're still paying attention at some level. And if you do something that allows them to participate or to, to bring them in, oftentimes they are ready to go, you know, and. I wasn't I didn't start clapping to bring them in, but it, it worked, too. And it was like, right, we can do all those other things that we do, including, you know, every fourth song. We'll we'll get them clapping or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And it was a really good reminder. I saw a show. Um, I saw Cheap Trick a couple of weeks ago and 
Um, and they were fantastic. They had um, they had it was the it was like the father son show because Rick Nielsen's son Dax plays drums now that Bunny is out of the band or out of the touring version of the band. Mm-hmm. And um, and then there was this other guitar player on stage that was, you know, I mean, he was there playing guitar, singing and at times like singing like full out like he was singing leads. I mean, they had him mixed well with Robin Zander. But but it was interesting. And he, when he would hit harmonies, they sounded perfect, like perfectly blended with Xander's voice. And it turns out that it's because it was Robin Xander. It was just Robin Taylor Xander, his son. Ah. Yeah. And it was really so interesting. The tonal match is, was that family tonal match thing was going on. It was. And I think there were moments where they had him there just in case, you know, Robin, the elder uh, had a note he didn't want to hit. There were certainly times where, you know, his son would take the higher part surrender. I've never heard surrender sound so good live because it had mm. that, you know, it had that Xander harmony happening all the way through it, just like it did on the record, you know? So, so that Such was a great band. They are a great band. Really Such fun. great songs. Really, That's yeah, really weird. fun. Yep. But ch- this guy named Charlie Farron opened for them. And, uh, Charlie was the lead singer in the Joe Perry project. I'm pretty sure that's the he was the lead singer of one of Joe Perry's bands. And I'm pretty sure it was the Joe Perry project. Uh, and then uh, then he had his own band called Fahrenheit. And then he actually went to like Compaq and worked in marketing for 23 years. And mm-hmm. now he's back out. In fact, I had seen him open for Joe Perry a year or two ago, but it was at, at the Hampton Ballroom and the sound in there was terrible and it was I, I had no memory of it, good or bad. It was just like, oh, there's a guy over there. You can't really hear him. Um, but he opened for Cheap Trick and it was just Charlie Farron and his acoustic guitar playing, you know, uh, some of his songs. And he knew that most people in the crowd aren't going to know Charlie Farron songs or Joe Perry Project songs. And so he was very interactive with the crowd and you know, he's a personable guy. He's got some of that on stage charisma. Like, you know, I mean, he's a lead singer, right? So he, he definitely knows how to smile and warm people's hearts and that mm. sort of thing. But he made that a one man acoustic rock show opening for Cheap Trick so interactive. People were happy. People were into it. Sure, there were a couple of people in, you know, various pockets of the place chit chatting because they didn't care about Charlie. They were only there for Cheap Trick. But by and large, he captured everybody's attention and warmed everybody's hearts just by being a performer. And he went he went a little overboard with it. He's like, look, I understand you guys don't know my songs. He's like, so I'm going to show you when you're supposed to cheer at the end of the song. I'm going to do this rock move that I call punch the sky. And, you know, he did that thing where he put his hand in the air. He's like, that's when you'll know the song's over and you can cheer, you know, <laughs> So like. But then people would right? It, like he was very, very skilled at that. Um and 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 that's sort of what started happening on Saturday night. It was like, right, if you give people the opportunity to engage, they will. Everybody's rooting for you up there, you know, yeah. and so you give them reason not to. But they come into this happy. It's not like you're trying to, you know, drag people out of uh, out of their houses. They already came out of their houses. They're out. It's a beautiful night. You know, they want to have a good time. They want to have a good time. <laughs> right. Right. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. Well, so that was an, another interesting thing on Saturday is people were into it. And they kept buying us drinks and, <laughs> and, and it was like, you know, we, we got to the second set or, or the set break or something and somebody bought us around. I was like, okay, that's fine. I'd had a drink before the thing or whatever. And I'd actually gotten a second drink for myself that I put on stage, uh, but uh, didn't really have most of it. And I was like, well, that's fine. I'll nurse it throughout the night. I don't care if it's cold or if it gets warm or whatever. It doesn't matter. And somebody bought us around at the at the set break. I'm like, right, cool, fine, cold drink, great. Uh, and then we're on stage, I think, in the middle of the second set, and somebody comes up and was like, "I want to buy you guys a round of drinks." And we all kind of looked at each other, like, "Wait, we don't really want to be drunk, like, <laughs> you know, like this is very kind." And finally, CJ, thankfully, just said, "That would be great." And you know, we told the guy what what beers we wanted or whatever, and he brought him up. And as yes, he left to go get him or whatever, CJ looked. He's like, you know, we don't have to drink him. He's like, but we can make that guy really happy by <laughs> letting him buy us a drink. I was like, oh, that's right. My, thank you, thanks for stepping in on that because we all were sort of stumbling. Like, 
we appreciate the gesture, but it's wasted money. Like, no, but you don't really want to say that to somebody. So, right. So, so that was an interesting thing because it was very much like not only not I mean, not only do we all have to drive home in whatever an hour and a half, like we also don't want to be drunk on stage tonight. Like <laughs> this is not our thing. So, yeah. But that was a, you know, that, that was one of those moments where thankfully somebody spoke up and was just like, yeah, OK, all good. <laughs> So, yep. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. My gig yesterday was a a disaster that worked. (laughs) (laughs) It was. We had, um, it was a fling gig. It was a full electric gig. It was that porch fest deal. And, uh, (laughs) we get there and we, we knew that we were playing in like a parking lot, which has happened. Like that's a normal thing. Well, this parking lot was also being used to park cars, which wasn't really a normal thing uh, based on what we had experienced before at these porch fests. And it was the parking lot of an abandoned hardware store that hasn't had hasn't been in business for like seven years. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. We knew that part going in. The fact that there were cars, there was a little weird. There was also no power, which was sort of interesting. And there was a there was like one spot where it was obvious that it would be good for us to set up and we called the you know the big organizer like hey where do we get power from they're like oh we'll be right there we've got that all set for you like okay great and there's this pole like you know a hundred yards from the stage area stage with air quotes and uh and the guy's like yeah i'm just gonna run an extension cord he's like is that that where you guys are gonna be we're like well you tell us where to be he's like well you don't want to be right by the pole here because that's kind of by be an earshot of these other two bands that are playing he's like so yeah you should be over where you you thought you should be you know, in the the front of this abandoned building. I was like, that sounds cool. And he's like, yeah, because I've got a hundred foot extension cord. That'll, 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 you know, so I can get it anywhere you want. I'm thinking it's a 15 foot pole that you're going to wrap. So you just lost 25 feet of cord. How far do you think this thing's going to go? <laughs> so he quickly realized he did not have enough extension cord to get it to us. And then he, I don't know, begged with the people next door and they had like a generator that they put at the edge of their property, which We've run from generators before without any problems. And this was an 8K kilowatt generator, which probably should have been enough. We've run from mine, which isn't a whole lot more than that before. But this thing did not make it. You know, we had to kill the subs and it was like, okay, that's fine. Fine. We'll kill the subs. And then we got halfway through the first song and it cut out again. I was like, all right, this is stupid. But we decided to try one last time. And then we went to the guys who had the generator. We're like, all right, how many extension cords do you have? And where's your closest plug? And we actually were able to get a, a cord run to an actual outlet. And the whole gig went fine from there. And it was really nice because, uh, you know, some people came around and it was a fun little thing. And Flink played really well. We were able to get sound good. But it was one of those just like, why? why We've us? had those things a couple times why us? When, when on a generator, actually sometime, uh, sometimes on land power, where the, the distribution of our of our electrical needs, we, like we've literally blown a breaker in the middle yeah. of a song, right? It's a really horrible feeling. Or, you know, one side of the stage goes out or something like that. And it is a really um, difficult feeling. I've, uh, I've, I've elevated my stage banter if my mic is still on. Yeah. Like band, the band is so hot, we blew the power type thing. <laughs> but uh, That's a good, but it I happens. Like I'm going to steal that line. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but it's one of those things where um, when you don't have a lot of time to test everything, right? Yeah. Or, you know, if there's anything wrong with with uh, with one part of the generator or anything like that. So there's always a little bit of risk when it's not tested power. Always. Yeah. The good thing is our, our bass player has a power conditioner as part of his rig. So mm-hmm. uh, we can run through that, which is which really makes a difference with all the active electronics and in, in like active speakers and stuff like that. Those amplifiers run much better if they're getting, you know, 120 as opposed to, you know, yep. 98 or something, uh, which is good because it also gives us a read like how how is this generator doing? Is it able to keep up and that sort of thing? Uh, but uh, without overheating stuff, because that's what will happen is your stuff will overheat if it's got to run at right. a lower voltage. And that's right, right, that, right. if you don't know, that's a really bad thing. So, 
Um, but yeah, this worked out, but it was like, God, we were so close to just packing it up and going home. <laughs> it was like, oh, you know, we haven't played a gig in a while and Aaron's here. He made the trek over from his new house. Like we got it. One more try. One more try. We'll make it happen. And we did, which was good. It felt good. It was fun. Persevere. Yeah. 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 You know, sometimes you have to, it's uh, but it was, man, what a, what a weird, weird setup. Yep. And it's, you know, and it, it made me realize, like you said, uh, you know, you've got to come up with things to say. Uh, it had been a while, you know, Fling hasn't played a gig in a little while. And most of the gigs I've been playing, I am not the front person, right? Like at the Monkey Fist gig, I said, I started clapping and people started paying attention. But I'm, you know, John's the front guy. I, I mean, I'm, I banter with him and all of that, but I don't have to lead that particular charge in that band. Mm-hmm. In, in the Amanda band, I definitely don't have to lead the charge. And in the fling band, I most certainly have to lead that charge. And it was like, right now, here I am distracted by all this other stuff. And I still need to be the one that's leading the engagement here. So I just wanted to shout out to all the front people out there, the front men, the front women, whoever it is, if you're doing that job, you know, you have my respect. But for anybody out there that's a side person on a gig, Make sure you give some props to your front people because oh. they are hung out to dry out there, whether you know it or not. Uh, they are the ones that are kind of, you know, at running point on that whole thing. And it is not they may make it look easy. They should make it look easy. But just like you make playing your instrument look easy, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. So well, on behalf of all the people. front men listening out there, I would like to thank you for that gracious acknowledgement of our role. Yeah, man, it's yeah, <laughs> it's uh, well, being being able to not play that role gives me great perspective on when I have to play that role and when and and great appreciation when I don't <laughs> I don't mind it. But, you know, when there's other stuff going on, it's like, right, somebody's got to be the one to pay attention and drive the bus. And that's, you know, that's how it is. So, yeah, sure. When they call a song and it's not your favorite, don't give them the stink eye. Just play the song. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. We can do a whole episode on that. Oh, my God. <laughs> that that I, I know all too well, probably from both sides, although I, I in my head, I'm sure I've never given the stink eye when somebody calls a song. But I know you know that I have. <laughs> it, it may be coming emoting through your head, right? Yes, I know. Yeah. But I try not to. And I'll tell you, leaders know that. And there's a whole range of things that goes on. You know, you're like, screw it. I'm the leader. Do what I say. You're like, all right. I'm not going to get a hundred percent buy-in, you know, I, yeah. I need to be careful, but with the song, you know, we'll go over. I mean, there's a whole range of decisions that you click off. It sucks. Uh, but I'll tell you the other thing is when your band is all bought in. And again, this is where strong, good leaders make it clear. I call the show. Yes. And your band just gives up the right to have it cross their mind. Oh, why is he calling that? And they're just all in. And again, you have to have a track record being right a lot more than you're wrong. Correct. Right. So Correct. you earn that by being a good front man and by being a good leader. Yes. But um, uh, this is where those leaders that there is no interpretation, uh, you know, there's no negotiation on the on the song calls. Right. Literally, I call it. You play it. Everybody's happy. When you're a really great leader and not 100 percent of the time, but when you're a really great leader, that vibe is just understood. Yeah. And it takes away a little bit of that. I mean, the reason people have that often is because they think that there's something better and they think that there's some negotiation that can happen. And no, you know, no you, that's you, always you, what it is. That's right. right. Yes. That, that's always so, what it is. No, you so got it Even wrong. if it's subconsciously you're raising your eye, you know, you're letting the leader know I know better. Right. Right. And so if the leader has done a good job saying, and again, trust you, you yeah. earn the trust by yeah. being right way more often than you're wrong, picking the right song for the right moment, getting the right audience reaction by the by a song that you pick. You have to earn that by being a smart leader and really knowing your songs and knowing you how to read your audiences. Yes. But, you know, it, those those things on stage, because the other guys in the band notice that someone is raising their eye. And now they're forced to take a position. Oh, crap. You know, is there going to be that tension? Is, is this going to carry over into the next rehearsal? Yeah. Is what's this a problem? What, yeah. What what's going? Yeah. Like the band, the, the stage is no place for Holy. that kind of drama. Yeah. And yeah. it's I mean, it's impossible to to, you know, hold to that all the time. But it really, I, you know, I am. Um, I, this is one of those scenarios where ignorance is bliss. Like if if someone is upset with a song choice on stage, I just don't want to know right now. You, right. We can talk about it later, but just don't let me know now. This is there's nothing we can do about it except, like you said, 
understand that now this is awkward and weird and the rest of the gig is screwed, potentially screwed because of it. Right. That that's um, yeah, it's good. But you have to earn that trust. I I built a set list for this fling gig as I normally do. And uh, and it was it was good. I peppered like I, I paced originals in, you know, every third or fourth song or whatever. And we were in the middle of something and we had a good crowd of people that we'd had for a couple songs. And uh, we were in the middle. Oh, I, I know what we were in the middle. We were in the middle of already gone by the Eagles. And as soon as that song finished, I was like, well, people are into this. I'm going to start the next song. And I looked down at the set list as we're ending the tune. And I see it's a fling original called Girl Next Door. That's great. I built it this way. I remember that starts with the drums. I don't have to wait for anybody. I do the drum fill. Everybody's in with me. Great. So already gone ends. I play the drum fill. The band sort of botches their way into, you know, by the end of the first measure that they're supposed to be playing, everything's fine. It's like, okay, what happened? But whatever, you know, it's fine. We do the song. It's great. And then Russ comes up. He's like, should we go back and do American Band? I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, crap. I had put American Band in between Already Gone and and Girl Next Door. But, you know, they Already Gone and American Band both start with A. So when Mm. I look quick while we're ending the tune, I see A. All right, what's next after A? G. Got it. That's what we'll play. (laughs) It's like... That would have been a much better song to play there. Uh, and everybody was like, yeah, we know. Like, I, evidently, I knew, too, just not in the moment. <laughs> and again, when your band's in sync, you laugh at those moments. You do. And, you know, totally. You, you, know, you give yeah. slack because there's trust, that type of thing. Yeah, right. It was like, oh, OK. You know, yeah, I effed it up. I mean, that's what, like, OK, all good. But the good part was, I mean, it took the band a minute to figure out what was happening, it, you know, and then we played it. It wasn't like somebody's like, whoa, 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 that's wrong. You know, you don't do that. You just like. That consensus is right. And uh, and if somebody's already playing, they are the consensus. Right. Even though I was I was a lone voice, I was playing the song. So everybody came with me, which was which was good. I mean, there could have been a moment like, whoa, Dave, that's not the right song. I actually saw Getty right. Lee do that to Neil Peart once. Mm-hmm. Um, he started this was on like their Hold Your Fire tour or something. He started playing a tune and Getty's like, hey, uh, did are we skipping one tonight? And Neil looked at him and sort of <laughs> shrugged his shoulders <laughs> like, OK. And then he went back into the next one, you know, or to the previous one, whatever it was. But uh, yep. but, you know, nobody caught me before the, the song started. So I was like, OK, well, then here we go. Yep. <laughs> I saw something weird. A uh, 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 band front man do this weekend. They, they played a pretty good set and, um, you know, good band, solid set. And then they kind of had the, the audience in a good place. And for their last song, he said, we have one more song for you. And then the, the front man actually asked the audience, what do you want to hear? You know, and he gave him two choices. And it was audience was about three, four hundred people, right? Wow. And I was thinking, and the, yeah, it was, which was weird unto itself. And there were two classic rock songs. And I actually listening, I thought that the audience was kind of split between the two. So he's basically now set it up to disappoint half the crowd, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, unless he's ready to play both, right? Unless he says, wow, you guys, you know, now we'll play both. Yeah. yeah. He did not play ball. Wow. So he just yeah, picked one. So, huh. Which is that kind of an odd thing asking, you know, it's like asking a rock audience a show of hands or something like that. It's yeah. like a, kind of a strange tag. That is a strange thing. I think on stage, you only want to ask questions to which you already know, you know the answer. Well, that's, and that's in life. <laughs> that is in life, isn't it? <laughs> that is true. Yes. But especially when you're you're up, you know, hanging 10 off the end of the stage, you kind of want yes. you kind of want to know what's going to come back at you. For sure. <laughs> Hey, I had a cool weekend this weekend. We had a club date at a good one of the three clubs I talked about that may be going away at some point in time. But we had a, a regular club date. Great crowd. You know, when you when you turn a when you turn a venue into like a hometown thing, even if it's not your actual hometown thing. Yeah, it's a really good feeling. You know, you're going to get a crowd. You know, there's going to be good energy. You know that people have come out of the out of the woodwork, have driven you know to see you made it make an evening of it. And it's just, you know, when you get that kind of appreciation, that's when clubs are really fun. Yep, for sure. And yeah, it was fun. And then we played a uh, concert series uh, on Sunday. And I want to talk about that a little bit because we had a sub in our horn section. And I have I have a small group of subs that I can get every once in a while. And again, I don't like subs. Subs, you know, my point to the band is. Everyone in this band, we've been around a long time. It's been the same band for a long time. You have fans who come to see you when we play. Whether you're whether you're lead trumpet, second trumpet, whatever it is, 
people have come to identify you in the house rockers and you not being there is, it will let them down. And if it's a habit and they never know who they're going to see in the band, I would start changing things around in the band. I would, you know, not allow the horns to come forward for solos. I would downplay, you know, if, if, if that was going to be the vibe, but I, from the beginning have been like, I want to build a brand and I want people to know what they're going to get. The house rockers never go out with a three piece horn section instead of a five piece horn section. Right. When, you see, when you see the house rockers, you know what you're going to get and you know who it is going to get. And building that familiarity has always been a part of, of what the band is about. But on occasion, I need to get a sub and I have a small pool of subs that are really a touring professional, great guys. And it's always interesting because you know that even though they're on stage with, you know, a pretty good size act one day, if they're not booked the next day, my hundred bucks or 200 bucks is just as good as anybody else's hundred bucks or 200 bucks. And they'll play with my band, you know, even though they've been playing for 50,000 people, you know, the week before when they're off that tour and they're just trying to fill their dates, you know, they, we've had them come. And again, we have a good book and, and, uh, and a good band. And they, you know, they seem to like us, these, these few guys, about five guys that I can go to, but they're rarely available. Right. Right. And then there's, yeah. then there's kind of a pool of local guys that are, you know, are available if I, if I should need, well, this weekend I had one of those A-list guys. He, um, he played one of the bigger, you know, classic rock bands of the eighties. He has been on the last two or three tours with them and a great, great player. And it's just fun when those guys come in, cause everyone in the band stands up a little taller play, you know, focuses a little bit more, they, you know, they know that, that, that there's a stud coming in to play with us right. and it does really good things for the band in many ways. It reminds us that we're good enough to have those guys sit with us. It, it uh, We just enjoy the playing. I mean, it's just really amazing to see what the guys at that level can really do. One, I think I told this story before once. One year I had three, I got a late offer for a corporate gig, and then, but I needed to sub three horns, which I is remember, never, that's yeah. the only time it's ever happened. Yeah. And it was three of those guys. It was like a Wednesday night and, and it was a San Francisco gig and most of those guys live in San Francisco. And, uh, and I was just amazed at what, guys like that do. I mean, they were figuring out horn lines on the fly and, you know, by the, by the second verse, they were in with something really cool and That's just so awesome. great performers. <clears throat> yeah. So we had a guy like that. And like I said, it makes the band, you know, stand a little taller, you know, focus on the plane even more, you know, much less loosey goosey stuff. And, um, and it's just, it's a, it's a good, it's a good experience for the band all around, especially because this is a guy that we really like and he really likes us. And then we had a couple songs where we featured him and uh, you know, you could just see everyone in the band was really digging to see what that ultimate level of musicianship can do. I mean, it, uh, it he's just, he's a great player and a great emoter of his, of his time. And the other guys in the section were like, you know, he is such a pro. He takes no liberties. He reads the chart down yep, and he plays rock solid. And when it's his time to step forward, that's when he does his thing. Whereas the guys who have something to prove seem to want to do it in strange and odd places. You know, uh, they, they overplay, you know, to try and show how good they are. But the guys who know they're real good, that confidence it reminds you what pro musicianship looks like. Well, that's exactly and, what it is, right? We were talking about confidence with subs and when we were talking about having your drummer sub come in and, and yeah. what you're describing there it, with the pro that comes in and doesn't overplay is actually a sign of more confidence than the person that comes in and feels like at every little nook and cranny, they need to fill something in so that, Hey, look at me. I can hold my own. It's like, you know, we, but we want you to just play the lines that act, that's actually better, you know? <laughs> yep. So yeah, that we confidence, them, comfortable we confidence. Them, um, what you won't do for love. Oh yeah. Uh, Bobby Caldwell. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, we open it up with a long solo section and, and this is one of the ones that we let the guy go. And, and um, it was funny I said to him afterwards, really cool solo. And he said, Oh man, I haven't heard that song since I, since I toured with the guy who wrote the song <laughs> and it was like, all right, here we go. Uh, so do it. Uh, that's yeah. that's so, a ringer for you right there. Yep. Exactly. So it, yeah, it was a really fun experience. And you know, the band is just like butter right now. I mean, I that's guess great. at the end of a long summer of playing so many gigs, the stuff that just becomes in your muscles instead of in your brain is, is uh, just really fun. And it, when it's the whole band that is like that, there's just a certain amount of 
you relax and you let the grooves drive you even better instead of everybody, you know, being amped up and needing to, when you just let it flow, it's just amazing how music can be so much different. Yes. Well, and that's, I mean, that's the trick is getting to that point as early in the gig as possible where the music can just flow. Uh, mm. And there are so many things that, you know, can impact that and even can impact your perception of that because the music might be flowing very well, but you know, you're in a weird spot or something's, you know, not quite right. And you don't quite realize it's flowing as well as it is or the opposite. Maybe you've had those few extra drinks that people brought up and you think it's going great <laughs> and maybe it is and maybe it's not, you know, but yeah, that, that flow, I know for me, it's the strangest thing. Maybe it's not. Um, but if my drum stool is not at the right height, exactly. I, I am like totally thrown off. And I can make it. I mean, I've played gigs on stools that are too low and too high and things like that. But, you know, when my drum stool is at the right height, man, everything in the world is good. <laughs> All's that, good with the world. All's good. But it's not always the same height. Like it's, you know, I, I, I need to adjust by half an inch here or there, depending on the gig or whatever. And it's like, it, but it's fine. I have an easily adjustable stool and I can, can't really do it mid song, but I can do it very quickly between songs. <laughs> But um, but yeah, it's you know, it's like those little things that can distract you from how well things are going or how terribly things are going. You know, you might not notice either. So, But that flow, you know, this is why it's always weird to me when I see like someone on Craigslist saying, hey, um, I'm, I'm going to start a band. I only want to play out once a month. You never will get to that state of flow playing out once a month. I you have to do it. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I, I don't know about that. I've gotten into that state of flow with a band that you know, I'm sitting in with for the first time. I mean, that, that band I was telling you about playing with, you know, where I'd sat in with them for the first time and the first and only time at that festival that we talked about last week, that, that gig had flow. I mean, I've, I've had, I've had band gigs where the flow is there from the first gig. And I've had mm. gigs with fling where, you know, we've been playing forever and the gig doesn't flow, you know, like, I, I don't know that the, it, it depends on how much, how often you're together. If it's a, I, I want to play out once a month, but let's rehearse once or twice a week, that kind of thing you can. And, and if you've got pros, you can get to that flow pretty well. Um, I, I feel like you need to know each other well, and certainly playing gigs is, uh, is one of the most efficient ways to do that, but it's not the only way I, th I uh, is, is what I'll say about that. I've never experienced th this level of just, like 10 guys on the same page. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it feels to me like it's a result of repetition. It can't, it certainly repetition is, is one way of getting there for sure, but it's not the only way, but it, but yeah, I mean it, it, you're right. But I, it, a, a band that plays once a month can be really tight. Um, I, I've seen it and I've experienced it, you know, from both, from both an, as an audience member and, and as a band member, it, it's not always the case. It's not certainly not the, not the, the simplest way to get there, but you've got to put, you know, you got to have some intention behind it. Whereas if you're playing gigs, you know, you're playing, you know, once a week or, or more than that, Ooh. that there's no, there's no additional intention required, right? You're, you're going to go play those gigs. Like, it's not like you have to schedule other things that aren't the gigs. So the, and, and the gigs are always pressure scenarios, right? Cause no matter what happens, you got to make it through. Whereas in rehearsal, you can sort of be, if somebody's attention drifts, it's like, yeah, whatever it's rehearsal. Like it shouldn't happen, but it's not as critical as it is on stage. Um, so yeah, but I mean, I think bands need to get out and play before they feel like they're ready because mm. I don't think you'll ever feel like you're ready until you've gone and done it, you know, five or six times. And then it's like, all right, now I'm feeling good about this. You know, it, it, that that's definitely true. And in the beginning, if you can get out and play with great frequency, that will accelerate you towards that, that point of being able to flow together for sure. Uh, because, because it, it just, you know, you're just doing it over and over and over and over again. And you're like, okay, now we're not as worried about the setup anymore. We know how to do that. So we can just get there and do that. We're not stressed about that. Now we can relax and play like, you know, those, yeah. those kinds of, th you need to get sort of the logistics of it out of the way and then just go. Yeah. And the uh, sound has to be right. And, right. You know, comfort, everybody's comfort. comfortable. Yeah, exa exactly. The material, yeah. It, it, I guess what you're saying is, if the material or, you know, the, the understanding of the material. So even if it's a once a month band, if you're prepared, everybody is at the same level prepared. So yep. you get the music into your muscles, not in your brain. 
And then, uh, you know, you have a comfortable setup on stage. Everybody's in a good place. Everybody can hear well. Everybody can hear each other well. Yep. You need a few things in order to achieve that nirvana. We have a bill. So uh, we have a, a leg up on this process in many ways. Yes. Right. Yeah. But you need. But if you had a different person in Bill's role every night, that would be a radical. Like it's, it's not just, you have a sound man. It is very much that you have a bill, just like you have a Steve on bass and a Nick on keys and right. And a Russ on drums like that. All it, it, it having everybody working together is the key. Yeah. Yep. And, yep. Just knowing that you can show up at the gig and it, especially the setup of it can go relatively smoothly without a lot of, a lot of on the fly coordination and discussion. It just needs to be able to happen like a well-oiled machine. That's, yeah. that's well, cool. I mean, having a bill. So we actually, I, I was talking about how in festival gigs, 30 minutes can oh. it almost can never happen for us. But because we had bill yesterday, we had an opening band and last year bill did the sound for this two band, you know, concert series. And um, he kind of pre-staged a lot of house rocker stuff. And the opening band wasn't happy that their drum kit wasn't centered. And, you know, you know, a few different things that he did, you know, for us. Sure. It was the headline. And so, you know, he tried to make the guy happy this year and he had to work twice as hard. We were, because our mixes were so darn close and he was ready for us. We did get up stage changed over us on stage, Mike sound checked in 30 minutes and away we went on time. So it's pretty cool. I mean, and it's, you know, one of the things you reminded that when it's easy and good, it's so good, but you know, you, like you said, if you had a different sound guy every night and he has to run you through his own process of line checking and sound checking yep. and which almost invariably gets us about 60% done. And then, you know, we'll fix it in the first two or three songs. It's just, that's just not fun. And then actually having the first two or three songs and waiting till the sixth or seventh song before it's really dialed in, you know, it's yeah. just not, no, it's, it's not it, wasted time. It's interesting though, because you know, as we're having this conversation in so many aspects of my life, I know that I don't want to be in my comfort zone, right? Because that leads to complacency and that's not what we're talking about here, right? That's there's two different things. It's you know eliminating the distraction of those little detours. Although, you know, it's those detours, the right kinds of detours and challenges that are actually the things that I really like about playing live music, mm -hmm. right? Like you want to you want to have your comfort zone so that you can get to the point where you're on stage playing and you can let anything happen. Right. And trust your bandmates that that you're going to take it beyond the comfort zone. But if your challenge is to just like yesterday with fling, it's like, OK, you know, like fighting through the power and all <laughs> that. The like, light's going to be on. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. It's like this is not necessarily the, you know, the on the fly problem solving that I wanted to do today. Like I wanted that to happen musically so we could interact and have all that fun. It's like, but now we get to do it with power cables and you know, how many extension cords can we string together without causing a fire? Like, <laughs> like, you know, like, like I guess there was that danger element, but that's cool, you know, but, um, but yeah, it's, I mean, you definitely want to have your, your logistics down so that you can just get yourself set up in a way that you, you can walk on stage to be comfortable, to try anything, business. to do your business. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, the comfort zone is not where the magic happens, but you need the, you need to start from the comfort zone and then sort of like leap out of that. Uh, and if you don't have the comfort zone to begin with, you're screwed. <laughs> so, For sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think we've we've kind of hit our do we, do we have time to go through this question that uh, we had on Facebook today? Go for it. All right. So listener Adam asked uh, on Facebook today about in-ear monitor mixes. He asked if they should be pre fader or post fader. So I'll explain what that concept is for anybody that, that isn't already aware. I'm sure most of you are, but it's not necessarily the thing that everybody every musician comes in contact with. What we're talking about is the monitor mix that's coming out of your board, right? So if you have your microphone going into the board, the fader will call the, the volume knob. On some mixers, it's actually a fader, and on some mixers, it's just a knob. But the fader is the knob that controls your level of that microphone in the mains. The question is, do you want your monitor level of that microphone to be affected when someone moves that fader up or down? Or do you just want your monitor mix to be static one level of that microphone or instrument regardless of what's necessary front of house and 
I think as we're explaining this, I hope that you're all coming to the conclusion that you probably want it to be pre fader, meaning you get your level before the fader is involved in the process so that if somebody has to turn up a, a mic or turn down somebody or whatever, it's not messing with your ears in real time. Uh, Especially for those people who are like most of my guys mix themselves. You know, they get a mm-hmm. they get a little app on their phone and they can. So it would seem like if you're post fader, you're battling the front of house guy. Well, that's the thing is it you now have this, you know, this unknown variable that is happening all the time and without your knowledge or control. And it can really screw you up. The only place that I've found post fader to work well is in a theater environment and in a very specific way. Um, all the instruments in the band, I want my own mix of, and I don't want whatever they're doing out in the front of the house to mess with it. So those all need to remain pre fader vocalists. However, I definitely want the mutes of their channels to be post fader so that when they are backstage, they're muted and I don't want to hear their conversation while I'm trying to play for somebody that's on stage. Right. So that that's sort of table stakes. You have to have that because they're going to talk when they're off stage. Um, I also have found that I actually like to have the vocalists mix come post fader in a theater environment only. And it's because the their their levels are being changed dramatically from when they're speaking to when they're singing. And if they're all singing together, the lead is going to be nudged up, but the lead is changing throughout the song. That's way too much for me to try and manage on my iPad while I'm, you know, playing the drums and changing things. And if the front of the house person is a good front of house engineer and is mixing all that appropriately, I want to take advantage of that active mix, mm. but only for the vocal channels. And if I can't, only do it for the vocal channels and I won't do it for anything because it's a disaster. You're more involved in this. I would think um, most of the guys create a mix where it's, and in fact, like my horns, I don't even think they take most of the things they don't, they don't right. use. Right. So, so they basically have the section so they can work on their intonation with a little bit more of them. Yep. And then everything else is just from bleed and they're happy. So, you know, you're, you're a bit of a more evolved being when it comes to in ears. I, you know, I, I used to think that, but Anybody that I've like when I'm certainly in a theater pit, people are obsessed about it. And mm. when I go see rock bands, you know, especially if we're playing a multi band gig, if somebody's on ears, like I, if, if they're not mixing themselves and they're asking the front of the house, front of house person or the monitor engineer to tweak things like people want people know what they want. Um, it's it's less less and less common that somebody is sort of just taking a blind mix or, or not really paying a lot of attention to it. And it's, I mean, it doesn't sound like your horn players are taking a blind mix. They're just, they know what they want. They're like, this is what I need. And I don't, I don't need the rest of this as a drummer. I need to hear the band, you you know, I need to hear the bass player. I need to hear the rhythm player uh, keys. Yes. Horn and vocals. Yes. Partially because I'm the drummer and I need to hear where we are in the song, but I also, I mean, I sing, so now I need that too. And so there's that, that's sometimes a fighting battle. Like, wait, I need keys, but I also need vocals. Like where are these things going to be? And that's where a stereo in ear mix can really make a difference because, you know, like with fling, we've got two guitar players. I have the guitars, not hard panned, but you know, maybe, I don't know, 10% or whatever on, on either side. And yesterday, Mike's guitar was a little low in my ears until we got to a point between songs where I could fix it. And it was fine because it he, Russ w- wasn't competing with him in my ears because Russ was in my left ear and Mike was in my right. So it was like, I can find Mike's guitar. It's just not quite where I'd want it, but it's, it's fine. And the same is true of vocals. I pan them all a little bit. So I'm on one side and, and everybody else is on the other a little, and it allows me to find that without needing to have the level at exactly the right point. Um, so stereo can really make a big difference for in ears. You, you might find you like in ears better. You might have an easier time with them if you could get yourself a stereo mix. Um, I know, I know we've talked about that before, but yeah. So if, 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 when you're setting up your new, you know, you get your Behringer X 32 mixer or whatever, all make all your monitor sends, whether they are your, uh, you know, wedge monitors or your in-ear monitors, make all of them pre fader. You like you don't want to you don't want to have your front of house engineer crank something and have it come 
up in your monitor and then start causing feedback, right? Like that can be a disaster with wedges. So everything pre-fader and you, you, it's, it's a good place to start. If you notice that you create, you're crazy like me and you want a little more control or whatever, or you mm -hmm. want to adjust control. Great. But start with pre-fader and go from there. You'd be much happier. I think certainly save, save some headaches. So got anything else, my friend? No, nope. Good uh, chat. It was Looking forward. onward. Wish me luck with my move. Yes. <laughs> Good luck with that, man. That's happening really quickly. So always be performing. Always. We'll keep our schedule as close to normal as we can, but uh, we will be flexible for you, my friend. 